good afternoon. Um, I'm Peter Cookson from Teachers College and to work here in DC. <coughs> it's, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to introduce Al and we'll either have a conversation about it. And I'm delighted <coughs> that the president of the Blooming Forum can join us today. So it is a conversation. Uh, Al's going to tell you about his work, but it'll be open-ended and we'll have a chance to talk about the issues that he, that he raises. I'll say a few words at the end, but they'll be very brief. I'm going to read a little bit of, to you about Al. Um, he's a good friend of mine, and he's also just, uh, as you'll find out, this, um, this brief vita doesn't really cover the kind of human being that he is, but formally speaking, he is the president and founder of uh, the Asia, Asia America Initiative. Uh, which he will tell you about. He is the former senior vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council and director of the Asia Pacific Institute. He is the editor of a weekly e publications, China in Focus and Asia in Focus. He has written many, many things on foreign policy, and I won't read them all out to you here. Um, but he has worked as a foreign policy and national uh, security advisor in the United States House of Representatives. In 2003, his um, Asia America Initiative, Grassroots Development for Peace in Zulu Project in Muslim Mindanao in the Philippines, received a presidential citation from President Arroyo for helping to hold the peace and deter terrorism in one of the most conflict places, region, plagues, regions in Southeast Asia. He's the author of many books, uh, a best selling uh, book, uh, Everything We Had, which is an oral history of the Vietnam War. He's also the author of To Bear Any Burden and a number of other wonderful books. He has contributed to many, many journals, the Wall Street <coughs> Journal. He's spoken at many universities. And I think I'll just uh, give you a sense of Al. He's also a, a member of the Disabled American Veterans for Wounds He Received While Serving in the U.S. Army in Vietnam. So with that, Al. Well, thank you, Peter. And uh, I'd like to thank Ruby Forum for inviting me today. Um, it's only been recently, even though I've attended events at Rumi Forum for the past, oh, at least five or six years, that when I started reading about the Gulian schools and the tradition of the, the Sufi um, spiritual connection to both social and economic development in Turkey and in other places in Central Asia that, I, that it caused me to realize that the work we're doing is not isolated. That our emphasis at Asia America Initiative first and foremost was to find the connection not just in terms of intercultural and inter, interfaith cooperation especially in the beginning of this past decade with the conflict of civilizations and the issue of international terrorism becoming more and more prominent, but also the disparity uh, in globalism between rich and poor. And the World Bank and the IMF and others have written many studies, and there's been books like uh, Peter Collier's The Bottom Billion and uh, many other profound analysis of what's been happening in the world of rather than people coming together <coughs> kind of drifting farther and farther apart and being polarized in what seems to be impossible situations and also with the relationship between north and south and population demographics and all of this on top of that climate change and the impact that that's having with food shortages water shortages and the potential for conflict arising from those most basic uh, necessities of life and on top of that, the, the UN, you know, conceding that their Millennium Development Goals, which they had hoped would create a more equitable world by 2015, are not even getting close. Um, that my frustration with government was that everything was coming from top down. That it was about theories, it was about concepts, it was about large tracts of money. <coughs> being given to central governments that were largely impersonal, um, poorly managed, and, and incredibly corrupt. And we can see a lot of the conflict that's happening now all, all over the world comes from those very basic premises of that if a government doesn't believe or trust in its own people, that there can't be peace and there can't be justice and there can't be development. So. 
at that point in 2002, um, I created Asia America Initiative with the idea being that there was crisis situations developed in many, developing in many places. And I felt confident because over the previous 10 years in working in Congress, one of my specialty areas was not so much conflict resolution, but conflict analysis. That there needed to be conflict resolution. And conflict resolution is possible if it's people to people. It's not very possible if it's government to government or ideology to ideology. And in terms of the economic development, it's impossible if trillions of dollars are going into dysfunctional centralized governments and the people at the bottom are being ignored. And um, being a small organization with practically no funding, um, I had to choose a place that I felt would be at the epitome of a lot of these contradictions, but yet where there was a very strong spirit in the people, no matter what religion they were, and a place that had diversified uh, religion, also that had ongoing terrorism and ongoing civil and religious conflict. And of all the places in the world where I felt it would be a, a great challenge, but also a great possibility for constructive development, it was the Philippines. 7,000 islands, 100 languages, close to 100 million people, uh, religious conflicts for 400, 500 years from the time of European colonization, um, and, a, and a major war. Now, th when the Sri Lankan War, which was the longest running war in the world, was subsided this past year, the new longest running war is in Mindanao that started in the late 60s and is continuing till today, still unresolved. And that was where we, that was where we started. And uh, by we, I mean, I felt that <coughs> if you bring in too many outside uh, individuals into a place where people are very sensitive about their culture, it creates further conflict. So the approach that we took was kind of a Gullian approach, which is that you work through the schools, community by community. You work also with the public health systems in establishing trust and establishing a kind of bond of loyalty that if you care about whether a woman survives childbirth, if you, if you care enough about a grandparent who's having a toothache to get that tooth pulled, if you have a child that's dying from malaria or some other bad water disease, that, that five cents worth of oral rehydration salt can save that child's life, it makes a difference. And you start to develop a bond of trust. When I saw school teachers working for no pay for months, and in fact, even though they had their own families taking out of their own pockets to provide you know, little bits of aspirins and stomach medicine for kids that had diarrhea um, and continued coming to class every day. And parents whose children uh, had no place to sit. You'd have 100 children in a classroom, which is routine, 70 to 100 kids, one teacher who's not getting paid, no books, maybe five kids per chair. When it rains, it comes through the roof. The floor fills with mud because many of the, the schools don't have anything on the floor. That was my kind of place because I saw people trying. No matter what the odds, they weren't giving up. And in many of the places, the people were Muslims. And what I also found is it didn't matter whether or not my religion was their religion. As long as we had an understanding that no one was trying to convert anybody but we cared about each other as human beings. And that was the basis of the relationship when I first started in 2002, especially in some very tough places where there had been a lot of violence. As the community got to know me better, and that, that means consistency, you just don't sit down with people and drink tea. You have to come back time and time and time again, no matter how difficult, no matter how you're feeling physically, it's important that you're there, that you're there and they know that you're with them. And that starts to develop a sense of confidence. Because when I first started talking with people in the community, especially students, it's like, well, why does everybody hate us? Look at how we're living. Why am I going to school? If I talk to kids who were in local colleges and the colleges didn't even have bathrooms, they didn't even have running water, it's like, why do people feel we're animals? 
If we went to school in the capital, we wouldn't be going to school like this. We'd be able maybe to find a job here. We can't find a job. And no, you're, you know, you're human beings. And by being there, and rather than bringing in computers, the first thing that we started with was the most basic elements. Do people have a place to sit in the classroom? Whether it be elementary, high school, or college, the important thing is that people felt that they were human beings and they were respected. I didn't have money. My best friend was the Grand Imam of Sulu, uh, who was a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, we both had cancer at the same time. He died, I survived. So people also in that community looked to me as I was the Imam's brother and, you know, I'm still with them. I try to be. Um, but he would go to meetings with me. We'd, we'd have town meetings. And we'd invi he'd invite people from various sectors. I'd always work through the ulama, which is the religious congregation, and supported, I have to say, by also the bishop of the province. Even though the, the, the Catholic population of the province is maybe 1%, it's an important 1% because, like Notre Dame College has the best school because it gets funds from outside where the local schools, their money was being stolen by government and they had nothing. But, so the, so the most prominent people in the community would send their kids to Notre Dame. So the population of Notre Dame College was 99% Muslim, but no one was proselytized. There'd be mass said every day, but no one was told they had to go to mass. <coughs> at the same time, there was call to prayer Sometimes I would stay at Notre Dame, sometimes I would stay at, other, at private people's homes. Yep, we'd all get up for call to prayer at 5 in the morning. Then if you're on the campus at Notre Dame, the church bells ring at 7. In between then, at about 6, the chickens and the other animals are up. So it's like living in New York City, you know. You, you always know what's happening by the sounds that are going on around you and you don't sleep very late in the morning. Um, but you get the sense of being part of the community. And by returning over and over, we had a situation where I brought, the first time I brought computers in, a couple of local school officials thought that they were meant for their homes. And um, we had to put a stop to that real quick. And the way I did it was, I said, look, I have to be loyal to the donors and I have to be loyal to the kids. So if the computers aren't back, by the time I leave this afternoon, I'm not coming back, which would be for them a great loss of face. And the computers were back. But the only response I got, I didn't say anything more. I didn't harangue anybody. I didn't yell at anybody. But the dean of one school looked at me and he said, you're the only one who comes back. If I was somebody that was dropping that stuff off and I, then I wasn't coming back because it's a dangerous war zone area and I'd done my part, I can check the box for USAID or Australian aid or Canadian aid or somebody. I don't want to single any one country out. Um, and then I didn't come back and I fulfilled my contract because I dropped off the computers. Those computers never would have reached the kids. But the fact that I was coming back made a difference. And that's, that makes all the difference in the world, is what people, people can trust that you're really with them. <coughs> that's what I learned about doing NGO work more than anything, is, is accountability, consistency, <coughs> and transparency. You have to be transparent too. If I ever caught anybody on my staff doing something that was not according to the rules of the organization and what I demanded of the community, which is everything is above board and what's intended for the community goes to the community, I'll fire them on the spot. And I've done that. And when they saw me fire my own staff, they knew that I was serious, that there would be no favorites played, there'd be no monkey business. And the fact is, if I said we didn't have funds, we really didn't have funds and everybody was accountable, that we all work together. If we need, say for instance, if a school had holes in the wall or holes in the ceiling and the rain was coming through, I'd have to find out, well, what material do we need to fix this roof or what do we need to patch up this hole in the floor or maybe to raise up a little something so that the water doesn't come in. And then we'll take notes, we'll figure out how much it costs. I'll pull whatever's in my pocket and I'll do that partly 
to make to show it as a theatrical example, but also because it's real. If I only have like thirty dollars or you know a thousand pesos, I'll say this is what I have. We need three thousand pesos. Who's going to help me? And PTA, okay, we'll do this much. Go to the mayor's office, okay, the mayor's office will do this much, and it becomes a community building process. So even in places where people have family feuds and clan feuds, and things don't usually work because it's my family against every other family in the entire community, we start to develop a consensus, and we start to develop a protective cordon around the most vulnerable element in the community, which is the kids. And as we, as we set up that protective cordon around them and all of us do our part, it's actually setting it up around the whole community. Because without knowing it, they're helping each other. And then when it startly starts to sink in that, they, that people can work together, you start to develop a sense of civil society. Democracy? Well, you can debate democracy. What democracy means, what an election is, so we put that aside. We're not going to debate that. But to establish some sort of rule of law, there has to be a consensus that rule of law is something that's essential for the community. And the first part of rule of law is we don't kill each other. Once you've established that, there can be dispute resolution based upon the common need of the community. Then you can start building these very grassroots semblances of democracy and cohesion no matter what religion or what language, because often you'll find in a community that people speak different languages. They can, there will be commonality of language to a certain point, but there's times, especially if you have settlers that come from other places and there's disputes over who owns the land, that language is also an issue. So you develop a common sense of purpose. And then if, like with the Gullian example, Everyone is working for the benefit of the kids, and by working for the benefits of the kids, you're, work, you're developing future leadership. So you have to know when you're doing this work, it's not a one, two, or three year process. You're talking about 10 years, and you're just starting to scratch the surface. 20 years, okay, so that generation that you started with in high school is now starting to get in positions of responsibility. And then 30 years, okay, those who are in elementary school have developed hopefully the right attitude. So there can be this communi proper communication among various elements of the community where people can work together. At the same time, you develop relationships. It's not so much you. You are secondary to the community. As, as an NGO, <coughs> the way I look at it, your responsibility is to provide confidence, some guidance if you have some technical expertise that's valuable, but most importantly, the fact that you're not giving up inspires people who are used to nothing good happening in their lives to realize they can do it. And I think for, you know, it's as far as we look at democracy, you know, democracy is about people believing that they can do it, that they themselves have the ability. And I think whether you're, you're reading the Quran or reading the Bible, the whole sense of you have faith in God, but also you have a belief in the free will, that it's your option which path that you take. God gives you that, gives you that option to choose a path. And um, we try to have it be the right path, the path that would lead to development, the path that would lead to peace. And we try by our presence, our, our consistent <coughs> presence, not being someplace all the time, but being there enough that people, people start to believe that they're not alone, that they're not at the end of the universe, and that people, others, do care. And that, that has been our basic framework in terms of our operational methodology and the, and the kind of spiritual and psychological path, because everything starts with attitude. And I don't care what culture somebody is. If you develop a friendship, and the attitude that's created by that friendship is a more positive attitude, then you have the potential for something good to happen. At the same time, you need to have the right education systems in so, the, so that the kids, and even the out-of-school youth and the adults, for our women's vocational program, which was one of our first components, we, our oldest student was 80 years old. It was a, a grandmother who wanted to learn how to read and write before she died. That was her wish. I just want to know how to read and write then I can die in peace. So 
the education is absolutely critical. And like I say, it doesn't take a lot of money. It takes some. You can't do it with nothing. But I think one thing we've proven in our work over a nine or ten year period is that when, when you can just have enough, if you don't have too much, too much creates corruption or it reinforces corruption. We try to have just enough that it can spark things to happen and then get others to, to pitch in and do their part. Because then it belongs to the community. And then for the World Bank, the IMF and others, they're starting to see now that the top-down approach is also not always the most productive. So there's more what they call sub-national to think about how do you get lending and how do you get investment in at the more grassroots level. So some of the programs we're working on now uh, with the support of the President of the Philippines have, are those the type of subnational grassroots development models. And um, yeah, but I think the key thing to the intercultural interfaith is it comes down to respecting people as fellow human beings. And um, I, I believe that there is a, a spiritual line that goes through all of us that sometimes can be separated by language, it could be separated by culture, but when you, you're in a situation where there's, everything is on the line, where people don't have a lot and they're accustomed to dying at young ages, it brings out the best and the worst in people, best or the worst, and what you want to do as an outsider is always look to see how you stop being an outsider and by your presence, you encourage the best to come out of people, the most constructive attitude, the most constructive development. And uh, I'd like to open it up um, for the other people on the panel with the, with the, with the issue of the Gullian uh, model and, uh, and also for Dr. Cookson and what he's been doing also with his, uh, with his foundation in terms of looking at education and this kind of constructive approach. Well. Thank you, Al. That was really inspirational, and it was, um, you really summarized your work beautifully. Um, did you want to make some comments, Al, on this? Uh, Basically, Al, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very uh, common themes to some of the work I've been involved in, particularly referred to uh, Mr. Gulen, Fethullah Gulen. And for those that don't know of him, he's our honorary president and an individual who's inspired not only the Rumi Farm, but as Al has referred to, uh, many educational <coughs> activities around the world, including a school in, in Mindanao, and I believe from uh, some academic studies, about a, a thousand schools in 100 countries. And along uh, the, the spirit that you mentioned, uh, he reiterates on so many occasions the concept of living so that others may live. So that is a very important philosophy that has allowed these schools, I'm specifically ref referring to these Gulen inspired schools, which share common themes of what Al has been referring to, is about uh, service to others uh, and all of the time to put others before yourself, that selflessness, that altruism, and it's something that, that, that breeds itself as people see that, people become engaged and want to play uh, a part in, in, in giving back. But of course the process is a long process. It is about generational change and the average person's education, no matter where they are, if they get to complete high school, is at least 12 years and if they're fortunate to go to college and beyond, you're talking at least 15 to 20 years. So the education of an individual is a long process, but it's a lasting process. So where they see uh, that those altruistic feelings, sentiments through the service, uh, we feel that, that that's part of the education itself, mm -hmm. not just the literacy, uh, the three R's, uh, but really about service to uh, one fellow, uh, fellow human beings. So, and, and these are very important themes that Al's touched upon, and I thought particularly for those that, that don't know, and we have an audience beyond this, this room that uh, they may care to uh, have a look at Gulen's writings in this, this regard and as some people refer to him uh, and I know you're a fan as well of Rumi Gulen's referred to as a somewhat of a, a modern Rumi uh, 
espousing love for one, one's fellow human being irrespective of uh, their identity that service should be for the sake of service and, and bring something worthwhile to, to others. And uh, this may be a summary of what you've said, but in essence, uh, it's a very important universal value. Well, thanks so much. That was great. Okay, I'm not going to say too much. In fact, uh, I just want to say one or two things. I'm going to read you a Rumi poem, uh, which I think actually talks a little bit about leadership, the kind of leadership that I'll uh, talk about. Uh, you know, I've known Al for oh, about a year or so, and I'll tell you the things that really emerged from my understanding and what he's talking about is this deep-seated compassion for other human beings and deep-seated respect for every human being, which is very Rumi-like. The Tula Galan uh, schools, his inspired schools are like that. And really beyond that, he also has a strategy. And one of the things that he didn't really touch on because of his kind of humility is his leadership. Uh, under a lot of very difficult circumstances, under really in some ways alone, although he has a wonderful group of people in the Philippines now, but he's worked all over the world in Afghanistan, he's brought with him a kind of a vision for how people can work with other people and to reach a goal that is a real lesson for all of us. And so 800 years ago or more, Rumi wrote a poem about this, and I thought I'd read this poem and then turn it open to all of you. <coughs> so, it's called The Lame Goat. Here's how it goes. You've seen a herd of goats going down to the water. The lame and dreamy goat brings up the rear. There are worried faces about that one, but now they are laughing, because look, as they return, that goat is leading. There are many different kinds of knowing. The lame goat's kind is a branch that traces back to the roots of presence. Learn from the lame goat and lead the herd home. So when I think about the roots of presence, I think of Rumi, I think of the work of the Rumi Forum, and I certainly think of the work of Al. So that's my comment. <laughs> And um, now it's open to, I wish all of you would just jump into this conversation, ask Al questions, or ask the President questions, or whatever you wish. Yes. Go ahead, you, you, you call me. Okay. Um, question is, with NGOs, you said that NGO a lot of officials don't go back or are never around. Um, with your organization being in Maguindanao and areas like that, how do you isolate your issues from the presence of rebel groups and Maguindanao massacre or the Ampatuans, not to say about a clan, but being in that same area? We, we try not to be confrontational, <coughs> but to work around those areas. And one of the reasons that when we started, people said, well, why are you starting in Sulu? Because Sulu always seemed to be the most difficult place because of its location, near Indonesia and Malaysia and also because it's it's held its own for 500 years against any invader and the tribe there is very tough the Tausuk tribe but the one thing that I said this would be a better model is because there was a very strong ulama and that ulama the religious leadership and the, tr the leadership of the elders was also tied into like I said Notre Dame and the Christian leadership. So you had, and that started when, uh, in 1970, the city was firebombed and pretty much the whole place was burned down. And it was the choice of the priests and the nuns to go to the mountains with the entire Muslim population rather than go under the protection of the soldiers who were Christians. They went to the mountains with the people and suffered, shared the hardship. So you had this built in sense of, for education, that there wasn't going to be a conflict. And it was also possible, like with the place you talked about, where there's a very strong warlord presence, you can go into the teeth of a, of a tiger and get your head chewed off. Or you could work around the tiger's den. And if you can develop a kind of, I look at it as like throwing a pebble in the water, the ripples of the water come out and then they go back in. It might be too, you, you might sink if you try to go into that water until you know that you've had these ripples build out and the water calms down. 
that as it comes back in, you can even deal with that dangerous area. So the strategy I had is that if we could succeed in a place that was perceived as the most difficult, the ulama is talking to the ulama in Maguindanao and other places, and we develop a solidarity. Plus, my country director is a Maranao, who's not from either the Maguindanao. We're talking about different tribal areas, for those of you that don't know the area. We then, as the water comes back in, so we're working now with Cotabato and Maguindanao and that area because we've established our credibility that people know who we are. The way that we've established our programs, especially when we've had to do refugee relief, when you're talking about Maguindanao and Cotabato, there's a lot of refugee relief because the fighting there over the past few years has been more intense there than anywhere. So instead of trying to build development programs in a totally unstable area, we're developing, we're developing our real agriculture programs in uh, Lanao del Sur, in Lanao del Norte, which is next to there, and in terms of the peace building down in Sulu. So we're developing this, and now we've been asked to help with Davao in terms of working with the hill tribes and areas too and doing mountain farming and whatnot. So you're developing this encompassing, these ripples, that as the, I was very pleased that a friend of ours that runs the school in um, Sultan Kudarat, um, who's a member of the Mastura family, defeated the Ampatuan family member for vice governorship. And that was the start. Now, you could say that that happened, and this is, this is again, it's not just you can go into an area and be nice to everybody. You have to understand the relationships between people. So it takes many weeks, many months, sometimes many years to understand the relationships between families, clans, and individuals. The Mastura family is from the, the Sultan who started the tribe. If the Ampatuans had tried to assassinate the Mastura, it would have been a bloody mess. And they would know they knew they would lose because you'd have all of the tribe against them. So by having, again, somebody who had been the headmaster of a school becoming the vice governor, which we had nothing to do with, we've helped their school a little bit, but they have done a great job on their own. Um, it establishes now that water is starting to, that ripples, those ripples are coming back in, and it's the possibility of doing development when you have better leadership in the meantime, we're working with Lanao Sur, Lanao Norte, and Sulu. So again, we're creating this cordon area that as that area in Maguindanao, where the Ampatuan clan is, is the most difficult, and the MILF is also difficult there, there's more of a chance of succeeding. But we don't want to commit suicide. We're not in this to die, because we have to live. The example that we have to, sit, that you, we have to set is that you can do this altruistic work and not be a victim. That's the key thing, because if you're going to have leadership over the next 20 to 30 years, and they think, oh, it's great, if I want to be a martyr, I'll do that work. We're not in this to be martyrs. We're in it to succeed, to really build peace. So other people have, have been martyrs, and we respect them very much. But it's not our role to be martyrs. Our, our role is to be positive and surviving peace builders but holding to our principles, and that's our strength and our power. Yeah. Mitzi? Yeah. I'm Barbara Pillsbury. I have a small consulting firm, International Health and Development Associates, mm -hmm. and want to thank you very much for your excellent comments and very inspiring example. Um, you began talking about uh, working as an individual, pulling the a uh, few, few thousand pesos from your pocket, um, and obviously you've had success in expanding since and to have a country director. Can you tell us a little bit about your fundraising experience strategies and results and the approach that you have when you have gone to the funders that you've had success with? <coughs> um, in, this, in this time period of the recession continuing, fundraising is very difficult. Uh, what we've done mostly because of our, the relationships we've developed is we've utilized a lot of gifts in kind. Where a lot of NGOs, especially the big ones, don't like to deal with medicines, school supplies, etc. because it takes money to ship them. So you don't gain money, you lose money when you accept. But if you care about the community, they need the supplies, 
you'll find a way to raise the money to get them where they have to go. And we've, that's where people have really come in and helped us because we've taken the chance. And I have to say, our organization now, we started in 2002, admittedly, where I started from scratch. We now have over a thousand youth volunteers uh, from, from uh, uh, Baguio in the Metro Manila area in the north into Visayas in Iloilo in down into all parts of Mindanao. So we're a youth driven organization and everyone knows the situation we're in so nobody expects us to pay them like the UN would pay somebody. Um, we work with practically no budget which is crazy and we, we have to develop a budget but in this, this time it's very difficult to raise money for overhead. We're, we keep trying, we don't give up, but our strength has been our gifts in kind. So we've had a number of corporations, like for instance with the flooding that just happened in uh, Sulu and also what happened in Manila last year and what happened earlier this year or in two, late, late 2010 up in uh, Isabella in the very northern part of the country. We were doing flood relief in the very north and the very south simultaneously. Uh, Procter & Gamble was kind enough to help us with water purification. AmeriCare's NGO helped us with relief supplies. We have a cancer treatment for the poor program and through that program we had NGOs in, or, or companies in Italy, France, and Germany that helped us with relief supplies along with AmeriCare's and along with the National Cancer Coalition in Florida. So we've been doing all of this on a wing and a prayer. And fortunately, at the longer we do this and the more people know our work, even if they can't come through with hard cash, which has been difficult, we're able to work with the gifts in kind and that's how we've been doing a lot of this. And in the Philippines, you know, the government is very inconsistent. Even if they say they're going to have funds for you, you can never count on it. But the Philippine military has been very helpful with logistics and transportation, not with money, but without that, the ships, Without even we did a, a program called Fruits of Hope where we stopped a war in 2007 with a farm to market program there was only two C-130 airplanes in the whole country and uh, Dick Gordon who was a senator at the time who was also the head of the Red Cross we developed a very strong partnership with the Red Cross because we were all doing refugee relief, relief and the Red Cross didn't have funds we didn't have funds but we developed the farm to market program and um, the Air Force contributed their C-130, which was not cheap. That's a lot of money and fuel. It's a big airplane. And then the department stores in Manila that could get all kinds of tropical fruits at a very cheap price, and they sold them out like that, um, partnered with us. We put together, with the support of the President's office, again, to convince everyone to do this, that it was in the national interest we were able to put together this consortium that actually worked. Now with that C-130, just again to show you the dangers of working in these places, um, they're very old, it was a very old airplane. And with I think one month <coughs> after we did Fruits of Hope, the airplane crashed and all the crew, the same crew that was our Fruits of Hope, all of them perished. Um, I've been on a number of airplanes that have gone down not fortunately without me on them, boats that have broken apart, these little smugglers boats that were converted that break apart because they, they're like made out of uh, plywood with these huge engines and you hit a wave and you go up, you come down, smash and a different part of the thing f flies off. So <laughs> it's, it's not been easy. I mean even the transportation is very precarious but if that's all that we get and that's from the military, it's not from any other agency. The other agencies will help us with customs. If the, we're doing the cancer treatment program, we're bringing in a lot of very rare medicines for diseases like hemophilia, which is a bleeding illness, or for different types of cancer, Department of Health will help us get through customs so that we don't have to pay huge exorbitant customs fees. That's a big help. So we're grateful to everyone, and, but, but the cash itself is difficult. So if there's anybody that sees this and has a little bit of extra that they want for a tax write-off for a 501c, we can always use it. Mitzi? Hi, I'm Mitzi Picard of Asia Society. And Al, I want to commend you for all the admirable and meritorious work you've been doing in Mindanao. 
My question is kind of a follow-up to um, the lady before me. And you talked about how you've been able to get the gov Philippine government to cooperate in your efforts. Now, my question relates to the Philippine military. How have you been able to bring them into the fold of your work? And how do the people that you're working with feel towards the military since they're fighting the anti-terror, the terrorist war against Abu Sayyaf in Mindanao? And then last but not least, my other question is, with Osama bin Laden's death, do you think the war, of ter war on terrorism in Mindanao will start to dissipate? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll go backwards with the questions. With the death of bin Laden, I don't think it has any impact whatsoever because a lot of what happens in Mindanao is locally driven. And the root, I think, of most of it is issues of mismanagement and corruption. And then that feeds into warlordism. Because if people feel they can't trust and they can't trust the central government to look out for their needs, then the local strongmen are the ones who manipulate and abuse the community. And um, so the key thing we're trying to do is curb corruption. Now, that ties into the trauma counseling we've been doing, which is that after 30 or 40 consecutive years of war, and 500 years of intermittent conflict, the attitude of people in terms of forgiveness, in terms of reconciliation, and in terms of developing cooperative uh, attitude, which the Fruits of Hope, this is, this is the thing that that program, we're trying to revitalize it this year. I'm trying to raise the money for that now because the issue of food shortages is critical and this is about where food grows wild but they wild millions of dollars worth of very good food that they can't get to market because of conflict, mismanagement, and corruption. So we do trauma counseling. The principals and superintendents of the various school systems we work in have asked if we could be training school teachers or certain teachers in each school to be leading trauma counseling for the kids. We also use arts, music, dance, and visual art as means by which for kids to clear their subconsciouses of things that they've experienced and to be able to express these things that if they don't clear them they'll be child soldiers by 11 or 12 years old especially if the schools are bad and they can't stay in school this is the way we're trying to stop the child soldiers with the adults if we can get them working for their kids and we have the military help when we started this program in 2002 um, we did it in consultation <coughs> with many government agencies. Because I was known for when I worked in US government, I was known for being very objective and very, um, I don't know what the exact word to use, but people trusted me. Um, and they knew that I wasn't gonna play favorites with anyone. It turned out that the one entity who really stood by us was the military. And when I asked soldiers, it would be like I'd be visiting with, at times even with, not the Abu Sayyaf, because they're more criminal than, than guerrilla. They're not politically driven, as they're kidnap driven or robbery driven, um, but some of the other groups. And I asked military guys, I said, do you guys have a problem with the mediation? Well, they knew that the Secretary of Defense and the, and the Armed Forces Chief supported what I was doing not supported it with money, but morally said, okay, you take the risk, that's fine. Um, with the M U.S. Embassy, I've barely ever gotten much support from them whatsoever. Um, and always the ambassador's worried I'm gonna get kidnapped or something where the embassy is gonna have to be responsible. And I always tell them, it's my responsibility, you know, you don't even worry about sending flowers, just leave me alone. And the bottom line becomes, as the military helps like Fruits of Hope, they help the people pack the fruit to get around the corruption in the ports. They flew the, f the fruit to market. There starts to develop a relationship. And actually, the Armed Forces of the Philippines now has, is building in a human rights program and also the Marines, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, everyone is bought into it. The issue of becoming more integral parts of a community not so much a occupation force and um, and a lot of the local NGOs and we're now seen more as since I'm the only outsider and all of our staff is local we're considered like a local organization 
that has the ability to work, to be flexible and work around in any part of the country where we're needed. Um, we develop a kind of a, a link also where we're not working for the military but we act as, as mediators. So if the community has a problem they can come to us because we don't live in the community we can address the issue. If, there's a, if there is a violation of human rights we can address it the right way. We might not go to the press but we can address it to the right people to try to get it stopped. If there's a, if there's a habit going on or if there's something that needs to be investigated we do our best in order to not have it become something that becomes more widespread violence. What was the other question, Nancy? I think you Okay, that's good. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Hi, uh, David Grant, uh, formerly of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation and more recently Nonviolent Peace Force. We have a uh, hundred people or so in Mindanao. And my question really, you've only mentioned MILF, Moral Islamic Liberation uh, Movement Front, once. And you began to talk about the relationship of, with these other, well, that's the, ma the main one. The uh, question basically is, how do you formally or informally uh, connect to uh, the MILF? Um, when you're working in communities, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I was out in the countryside on the border between Lanao del Norte and Lanao del Sur province. And I spent a day with farmers looking at their irrigation systems and looking at seeing how, what kind of seeds did they have, what was the strengths and weaknesses of developing their agriculture in that area. And at the end of the day, and the local police and, fo and folks with us were all local people. They were mostly all from the Maranao tribe. And at the end of the day, I, you know, I said, I said, wow, I heard this area had a lot of MILF. Where's the MILF? And then everyone started laughing because the entire day I was with the family of M families of MILF, <laughs> and it was was not an issue. And they said, well, you know, mashallah, brother, you know, I mean, we consider you our friend, so don't worry about that. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, about our family members. You know, we all know you're here for a good reason develop those kinds of interaction. On the other hand, when the peace talk broke down in 2008, it was pretty vicious. And there were things that happened where we found, cause we talked to some people that were kidnapped in Iligan as to who did the kidnapping and it was very violent. And um, there were people that came in from outside of the community, called themselves MILF, they may or may not, but they were speaking Visayan, they were speaking Tagalog, they were not speaking Maguindanao or Maranao. So it becomes very much of a, in all directions. Plus you've got all the gangs that are there, like the, like the Pyramid Gang and all of that, that are actually criminal syndicates that are also very violent. And in the mountains, and, and the Lumads, the mountain people are always forgotten. And people forget it was their land once upon a time. So we, we're now really involved in terms of this peace process. When you're talking about the issue of ancestral domain, the Lumad should have a voice also. And the Lumad area is where the NPAs, the Philippine Communist Party militants, are mostly active. And it's also the area where you have the most child soldiers. So we're also involved in people trust us and we're doing more highland development programs. Um, the same thing. It's a matter of getting to know people by your work rather than trying to do it institutionally for us. Other people have to do it institutionally because that's their job and that's their role. For us, it's just our niche that we do it through the actual activity like that day in the field. And we never asked somebody when we started, uh, is your son or your husband, they're not here, are they MILF? We just were working with people and then at the end of the day they said, yeah, but you know, it's not an issue. You know, let's work together. So in that regard, we become kind of like almost organic mediators because we're accepted as not outside of the community, they consider us friends. Yeah. But for organizations like yours, a lot of respect. And uh, your approach will be a little bit different than ours because, because your mandate and your mission is a little bit different and it's okay. You know, we all work together for the same purpose. Any more questions? Any more thoughts? 
did you want to did you want to make any comments? Uh, Maybe a final comment from me, or possibly uh, really a, a question, Al. Uh, I mean, wh wh where are you headed? I mean, what are the short-term successes you'd like to see, and what are the medium, long-term, and and how far away are they? Are they possible? We're setting, I think, realistic targets, which is for the economic development, especially around food and water, which is critical <laughs> to the peace process, and it's critical for survival and of not just our the people we work with in our our home communities but also surrounding communities and surrounding countries so this year we're targeted on trying to rebuild out the fruits of hope program our gardens for peace we have two provinces that the president of the country has an economic development program has asked us to coordinate uh, our schools it's a lot and our cancer treatment and other special medicines programs we're working on the, the, the key thing in terms of the international recognition of what we're doing and where it could be helpful is our mass communication. We need to become better with our media. That's why I'm happy that we'll have this video that it'll be on your website, we'll put it on our website, and other people can share at least parts of it. So that, I think it's like with the Gullian model, with Peter, what you're doing with your book in terms of education equity, and for what we're doing is that they become models that can be adapted to other cultures and other situations. And um, like I say, the, the, the key thing is to be able to inspire people working within their own cultural environment to find the best, best practices and best solutions. So that's our goal mm -hmm. for this year is to expand our ability to get the word out and to help inspire people. Mm -hmm. Thank Al, you. do you have a website? Yes, our website is www.asiaamerica, with two A's in the middle, dot org, www.asiaamerica.org, and also we have Facebook, <coughs> and also with Facebook, if you want to see what I talked about, our many youth volunteers, uh, it's AAI Catalyst for <coughs> Peace, Catalyst for Peace is the name of our youth organization, and um, They've been the heart and soul. I mean, the energy, the dedication, the, the um, altruism <laughs> of the youth has been incredible. Of the youth, what proportion are Christian and what proportion Muslim? For us, of, of I'd say for, for of the youth we're talking about, <coughs> I'd say 45% Christian, 45% Muslim, and 10% Hill tribe. We're right, we're right about evenly split. We didn't try it that way, it's just working out that way. There's, there's some wonderful, inspiring pictures too. Of, you didn't talk so much about the Peace Caravan, but there's a whole bunch of programs that you can find on the website where all kinds of young people are involved in it and uh, you get to see it and it's really powerful and moving and uh, we won't forget it. Yeah, the, the, the school individual principals and school superintendents have been very, very supportive, <coughs> and then backed up by the PTAs of the individual schools. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, I want to thank thank the Ruby Forum and thank you Thanks for welcome. providing this uh, with wonderful. I think there's a lot of synergy between this work and Al, and yeah. all the work that he's done, and all the work he's going to do, and all the people that he works with, some of whom are in this audience here, and many are in the Philippines. And thank you all for coming. And thank you all for participating. Thanks so much. <laughs>